Our subject is the definition of criminal offenses. Criminal offenses are defined in terms of elements. That is, they are defined as distinctive sets of elements. The elements of the offense charged make up the prosecution's case in chief. That is what the prosecution has to prove, and to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. This is what due process requires. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt of every fact necessary to constitute the crime. That is, to establish each of the elements of the defined criminal offense. What does it mean? It doesn't mean beyond any conceivable doubt. It doesn't mean with mathematical certainty. For our purposes, is it, a, it is enough to note that proof beyond a reasonable doubt means more than a preponderance of the evidence, more even than proof by clear and convincing evidence, whatever that is. Even so, appellate courts repeatedly uphold convictions supported by evidence that you and I might think rather sketchy. The appellate standard is affirm if a reasonable jury could find that there was no reasonable doubt. Courts are normally unwilling to second-guess jury findings about whether a doubt or any other risk-taking risk is reasonable. Our subject is substantive criminal law, not evidence, and not criminal procedure. Criminal procedure is covered in several upper division courses. That said, to get perspective, we take a brief look at plea bargaining, one aspect of criminal procedure. Often, a plea of guilty is negotiated. The defendant waives the right to a jury trial in exchange for the prosecutor's promise to recommend a lower sentence on that charge and to drop other charges. A plea bargain is negotiated largely on the basis of estimates of the likelihood of the evidence establishing the elements of the defined criminal offenses the d defendant is charged with. You can't intelligently bargain unless you know what the probabilities are probabilities of. Consider these facts. About 94% of state court felony convictions are by guilty plea. Of the defendants who went to trial, only 17% were acquitted. Sentences after jury trial were on average three times longer than sentences imposed in comparable cases after a plea. Suppose you are arrested and charged with a serious crime, an armed robbery. You know you are innocent, but there is an eyewitness that has identified you as the perpetrator. You have no alibi. You cannot afford a lawyer. Only one in five felony defendants can afford one. You cannot afford bail. So you are in jail awaiting trial. Your court-appointed lawyer visits and tells you what the DA is offering you in return for your guilty plea. You ask your lawyer what you should do. She says it's hard to say. Each case is different. You ask, what happens on the average? You know you're innocent, but you need to make a rational decision. You need to get back to your life. Your lawyer sighs and explains the big picture. Look at the left-hand column, probability of conviction. If you plead guilty, your chance of being convicted is 1 on a statistician's scale of 0 to 1. If you go to trial, your chance of being convicted is 0.83, since on average only 17% of criminal trials result in acquittals. Go to the middle column. Statistically, after correcting for differences, different offenses, Defendants who go to trial wind up getting sentenced three times as severely as those who take a plea. Judges who typically set the sentences are not supposed to punish people for putting the state to its proof. 
but you'd never guess that based on the statistics. So multiply the left column by the middle column and you get what's in the right hand column, the expected value of your options. If you plead guilty, you can, let's say, ex expect to spend a year in prison. If you insist on a trial, you can triple that. You slightly lower the average chance of conviction, but you triple the average sentence. If you are being coldly rational about this, your better bet is to take the plea, even though you know you are innocent. 12 months in prison? Or 30 months. There's an eyewitness who says you're the one who did it. In Alfred Hitchcock's 1956 movie The Wrong Man, actor Henry Fonda portrayed an innocent man accused of a crime. There was an eyewitness. Numerous studies establish the doubtful probative value of eyewitness identification of strangers. It's worse when the eyewitness is of a different race. Nevertheless, juries have returned countless guilty verdicts based on the testimony of a single eyewitness or even on wholly circumstantial evidence. Remember Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, which you read for orientation.